everybody. Welcome back to Addiction and the Three Principles. My name is Greg Suki. I'm here again with Harry Derbitsky, and today we are rejoined by Joe Bailey. Um, I'm pretty excited to have him back on because I, I kind of missed being part of the, the last time I was in a car trying to uh, trying to host this and record it and everything, and it didn't work out so well on my end. But <laughs> So I'm pretty excited to have you back on so I can actually participate this time. It'll be a a different experience there. Um, but now, Joe, you, um, I think I've told you, that, but your, your book, The Serenity Principle, is actually my, my first three principles book. And it really tied in everything I'd been kind of thinking about my time in AA. I couldn't really put it into words, and then I read your book, and I'm like, that's it. Like, that's, you know, that's what I've been trying to articulate. And I, you know, I've just loved everything that, that you've been doing and all the, all the help you've been giving people and all these programs you've started and training people. And it's a, it's a really beautiful thing that you've been up to. And uh, before we get too much into you, I know Harry has something to say, but uh, we're definitely going to get into what you're up to. And I, I heard a rumor about a book. So hopefully there's another one coming. <laughs> and uh, without any more from me, I'll hand it over to Harry. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah J Joe's definitely uh, um, among the, t the most important people in terms of, of evolving the addiction community in, in this, and the three principles. It's been impressive, actually, to when you look at his resume, uh, what, what he's accomplished. And I think his new book is, I think, called The, the Burnout Solution. And uh, it, which is coming out, and I no. just no, no, no. That's not the next one. <laughs> oh, it isn't. Oh, I read it. Okay, well then yeah, you can I'll, I'll you. update that one. Yeah, that's yeah, all right. Okay. okay, I thought. Yeah, and and I just wrote a book called The Evolution of Addiction Recovery, which is the title of our talk here. So uh, obviously important. And Joe, I, one of the things I was thinking, what is the question I wanted to ask you? You, you, you know, in regards to the evolution of addiction recovery. And it, it, it comes down to, the, to something that's dear to my heart. Um, you're, you're working in, with Gulf Breeze and different programs, and it's been extra impressive. And, and, and we had Daniel on, on in January, and, and, and we're, the next show we're doing with Amanda comes from an idea that's spurred from last time I, we talked on a, a show. And uh, um, the question I have, Joe, is what about the poor people? Like, uh, Gulf Breeze is an expensive program and so on. But in the evolution of addiction recovery, primarily we look at people who can't afford $15,000 a month. And in working with them, they're, they're exposed tremendously to uh, a lot of 12-step uh, Christianity uh, psychoanalysis types of approaches, which contradict what 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 we're teaching here. How, uh, you don't have to deal with it directly right now, but it's something I'd like to, like you to take a little by a little bit of an approach to to the ordinary person on the street who takes himself off the street and goes into a detox center. Or, or so on, and dealing with all those homeless situations and mental illness situations. Um, that's part of the evolution, and that's part of what 3P has to deliver services to, uh, if it's going to be really effective. So that's my question to you, Joe, in, in, the, in, the, in the movement of stuff. And now, have some fun. <laughs> well, and congratulations, Harry, on your new book. That's great. Yeah. I know. I'm, just, I'm a little bit jealous because I've, I've been working hard on two books and um, I haven't gotten to the point where you are yet. So, Well, uh, the, the last step was the hardest and, uh, and uh, it, it forced me to want it and it was truly a, an act of passion, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. truly, truly. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And, um, and just, I won't address your question right off the bat, but just real briefly, um, yeah, this has been um, utilized in programs 
you know, with all economic levels, you know, in treatment. And most of the programs I have worked with over the last 30 years have been mostly for the poor, mostly for people who are what you would call skid row or indigenous populations, um, court ordered people. So um, you don't have to have all the sauna and the ocean and everything for the three principles to be an effective treatment, that's for sure. But, you know, we have different, that, that's just one, one way of uh, getting this out in the world because it really is, I think, um, as um, we've often talked about on this show and with many other people who've um, spoken here, this really is a truly a paradigm shift for um, not just the field of addictions, but for the fields of mental health, for coaching, for uh, psychotherapy and family therapy and uh, working in, in um, high-risk communities and school systems and it goes on and on and on and on. The, the applications are infinite because it's all about human beings and how the mind works and what, what Sid brought to the world with his insight. Uh, an ordinary guy, you know, not really knowing what he was looking for, uh, out of the blue had a transformational experience that was extraordinary and powerful. And that experience to me, that Sidney Banks, a man of little education, not someone who was going to, you know, retreats and seminars and reading every self-help book on the subject of, of psychology and, and all these different things that people who are seeking are doing, it, it just hit him out of the blue. And for me, that gives me and, and the people I work with hope that if it can happen to Sid, if that can happen, uh, maybe it can happen to me too. It just throws the possibility out there that we can all transform at any moment. Now, not everybody's going to have an experience like Sidney Banks or a Bill W. type of an experience where in that incredible moment, their whole life from that point forward is, is extraordinarily transformed. And it, it ripples out and affects hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So you don't want to hold out necessarily like, oh, I, want, I, I got to have Sid's experience, you know, because for me and for a lot of the people I work with, the, the beauty of, the, of what Sid brought to the world with the three principles is that it gave uh, us a way that sometimes we might have a, a, a larger leap in our evolution, a larger transformation that completely changes our life. And when I met Sydney 38 years ago, I had that kind of an experience uh, where it was like a, a line in the sand. It was a, a crossroads. It was a turning point in my life. And everything that I had believed prior to that point all the training I had had as a clinical psychologist and addiction, addiction specialist, it, it kind of pulled the rug out from underneath every bit of it. And from that moment forward, I had no clue what I was doing. I knew everything that I had been doing was now somehow erased. It was, it was uh, disqualified. I could see that so much of what I was doing and why it wasn't working was because it, it, it had so much misunderstanding about where the, the, the actual source of experience is. Our thinking in the moment is the creator of our experience. And that, that it, to, to boil a whole thing down into one sentence, that we are living in the feeling of our thing, thinking moment to moment is how I like to talk about this. Be, and, and, Keith Blevins and many people talk about it that way. I, it's just a, a good shorthand because it's so profound that most of our lives, we go through our lives thinking constantly, but never really realizing that we're always thinking. And then in this moment, what's giving me my anger, my sadness, my joy, my gratitude is not what I'm thinking about, but the fact that I'm thinking. That's, that's the, the power of Sid's insight that gives us ordinary people who may not have had that profound spiritual awakening uh, an understanding or a tool that will allow us to maybe more gradually evolve over time. 
And I've had a couple of those bigger experiences that what I would call transformational uh, to the nth degree, where from that point forward, everything changed. But in between those couple of experiences that I've had, there's been on a daily basis, uh, uh, on a very regular basis, how the principles help help shore me up, help bring me back to that simple fact, oh, okay, I'm just, this, is, this isn't happening to me, this is happening from me. And for me and for all the addicts that I've worked with and people, not just the addicts, but their families and the, and the spouses and the, the children and the parents and, and all the people that are rippled out and impacted by addiction, the simple understanding of the fact of where our experience and where our feeling is coming from is so profound that it continues to evolve us over the course of our life. Sometimes in just little ways, just, just tiny ways. And sometimes in, in huge ways that, you know, save a relationship or uh, give us a breakthrough uh, in our writing or in our work that makes, uh, or even in our sports, you know, like for me, um, uh, just coming cross country skiing, the more I recognize how my thinking is making me tired in the moment because I'm thinking of how much farther I have to go, just in that moment, seeing that, all my energy comes back in my body and I've got more energy to continue. So even on the little subtler, but very important parts of our life, the principles keep informing us and, and evolving us and changing us. So when I think of the evolution of the field, I really think of the field. What is the field? The field is just all us people. <laughs> it's just one individual after another individual after another individual. And so the field evolves because people are evolving. And as the word gets out about the principles, and it gets out indirectly, directly through my book, your book, Harry, other people's books, through seminars and therapy programs and Judy's programs with families and what you guys are doing in, in Oregon. You know, there are direct ways and then there are ways that it's just kind of by osmosis being absorbed into the culture. I hear it in AA meetings. I hear it in OA meetings. I hear it in Weight Watchers. I hear it on the TV. And I, I swear to God, that is like a direct quote from Sydney Banks. <laughs> and that person may have never heard of Sid Banks. So it, as, as a new paradigm, gets out in the world it, it like gets in the water and it, it infects every everything so i'm not worried about where this is going the cat's out of the bag this health virus of health realization of wisdom is in the bloodstream of humanity and it's going to just keep carrying us so from the microcosm of the individual to the macrocosm of chemical dependency treatment, substance abuse treatment, psychotherapy, these bigger, you know, kind of professional domains. I feel that um, Sid's work is done in a way. And, and I know that at times we as, as practitioners of this, as teachers, can get really nervous, like, oh God, is it, you know, am I doing it right? Am I, is this ever gonna go out in the world? And, and, and more and more I see, you know, we can really just kind of relax. <laughs> we don't have to make it happen. It, it, truth has a life of its own and it's weaving its way. You, 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 you look at, at some of the research in quantum physics and you see how the DNA evolves in animals and in nature and 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 it just there's an intelligence built into it that's evolving all of us and that and in terms of our psychological evolution the principles are in that bloodstream now and it's it, it's you know remember that story of the hundredth monkey how many of you raise your hand if you've heard the story of the hundredth monkey well if you haven't heard it long time ago, some anthropologist or uh, uh, animal anthropologist studied these monkeys on an island outside of Japan. And if I don't have the story right, someone correct me. And he just was observing their behavior and he, he saw that 
that uh, the animals would um, eat these particular seeds and it would always be covered with mud because it would fall in the near the this the bank and and um, and he observed that this one tribe of monkeys um, for whatever reason started washing the seeds before they ate them um, and and pretty soon another one would be washing their seeds because they taste a lot better without the dirt on it. <laughs> the word got out amongst the monkeys, they were chattering. And, um, and so you watch this and over time, every monkey in that tribe started washing their seeds from the one mother that had discovered it. But the interesting thing was that on another island that had no communication with that tribe of monkeys, that tribe of monkeys had the insight at the same time or shortly thereafter. And they all started doing it. Now, is that the quantum field? Is that the spiritual reality? Is that psychic phenomena? I have no idea. I don't know how that works. I just see it happening. I, I see it happening like when people in treatment at Gulf Breeze or Cedar Ridge or Twin Town or other Farnham and other places I've worked with, when a person in the family has an insight, has a transformation, that phone will often ring and that person that has been hating them or struggling with them will somehow pick up intuitively and they have a conversation. And I go, wow, what a coincidence. What synchronicity is that? So there's some level at which we are all connected on a spiritual plane, on a quantum plane, if you're a physicist, that at some level there's this intelligent communication that's happening. And it's not the internet, although I thank God for the internet. And uh, so I think that um, just the way I think about this is that we just keep living our life and enjoying the benefit of what we've discovered and the insights we've had. And as we are inspired, we share it with other people in this format, in books, in, in conversations at the grocery store, at the YMCA, or wherever you happen to, it, it just, it'll just come out of you in a very natural, organic way. And that's how this gets passed on. It just gets passed on. We, we saw this in Modelo, right? Scotty down in, and Scotty was very involved in Modelo down uh, the housing project south of Miami where Roger Mills and Scotty and many other people spoke to these women. And there was just five women, right, Scotty, that he trained to be leaders and um, taught the principles to. And from that, eventually, within a two-year period, that entire community completely changed. The kids started going back to school. They quit being truant. The drug dealers left the community. Uh, people cleaned up their houses. They started getting jobs. They started going back to school. The school system got curious, they, they wanted to learn about the principles, the social workers who worked with the parents. It, it just rippled out to this whole community, even though they only worked with five people intensively. It just rippled out and it, it evolved. So um, anyway. Can I, say, can I say one thing yeah, about I'll just, Yeah, this, I've been kind of no, on no, a, no, 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 it's been beautiful what you're sharing. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, it's soft and very, but one of the things about Modelo from a personal experience was that when Roger came on for the first time at a, at a, a global conference, he brought the five women there and it was the five women that knocked the socks off everybody. It wasn't Roger. Actually, Roger, in my mind, is the best uh, teacher teacher like a, a teacher uh, of, any, of anybody who has come. But, he, but his energy was small in comparison to what they were feeling alive in the moment. And they inspired the whole conference. And from there, I took an, a, a feeling and said, I can do that too. And that's what you're talking about, Joe, is, is it doesn't just come out from Joe. Joe helps somebody who all of a sudden wakes up and that creates the evolution. 
when, one thing Sid said, Joe, I was listening to an old tape and Sid said, evolution uh, happens uh, when people awaken. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what you're talking about, organic free movement is, is beautiful. But it comes from, I, I'm starting to feel it doesn't come from Joe. It comes from who Joe helps type, type of thing. Yeah, and I, I know you guys probably feel this too, all of you probably feel this, that when you're really speaking from that impersonal wisdom, when it's not from memory or beliefs or, you know, cool ideas, it's just, you know, in the moment from the heart, when you're speaking from that, it, um, it resonates at some level with people they hear truth they recognize truth and it changes them so this is um what, insight begets insight would be another way of saying it you're you're demonstrating a feeling you're demonstrating a knowing and it it awakens something in the human spirit that we're all looking for now addicts look for it innocently um in hallucinogens or meth or crack or cocaine or alcohol or pot or whatever uh food sex porn uh, people are looking for a feeling because they don't have the uh the knowledge the, the the knowledge of of where true deeper feelings come from that it's within and so that was another thing that Sid always said, what you're looking for is within you. It's not, don't listen to me. Listen to the truth in your own heart. Truth is, is written in the hearts of every human being throughout time. So this is a great leveler. And it's the, the students often surpass the teachers in this business. You know, I listened to uh, prisoners in England the other day. This, I might have even talked about this the last time. I, I've been interviewing people for my book, which is the, the new book actually, Harry, is called The Transformation Principle. And it's a follow-up of the Serenity Principle 30 years later. And, um, but it's looking much broader than addiction. It's looking at transformation that happens in prisons, in in um, companies, uh, in athletic, you know, I'm looking at interviewing people from all walks of life, people from the Mayo Clinic that I worked with. So I'm inter collecting lots and lots of interviews, but I'm showing the golden thread of those transformational, insightful moments and how that led to that transformation and outlining a process, kind of a description of how that kind of sort of works. <laughs> you know, what, what, what what we can pass on with words to other people that will help facilitate people's transformation. So, um, like one of the things that people often get stuck with in learning about the principles that they think that there's a there to get to, like a ceiling or something, or like there's a a point once you get it, then you're there. And in my experience, that's really a baloney because you get it and then you don't have a clue and then you get it and then you don't have a clue and then you get a really big it yeah and then you don't have a clue and it's a, it's a yo-yo of of consciousness and sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't but with each challenge that we hit in life each time we fall on our ass pardon my french it's an opportunity once we under have an understanding of how evolution of the mind works those fallings are actually like beautiful moments when you when you find humility and open mind and heart and you're on the the doorstep the bus stop for another insight that will take you to a higher level of consciousness but each insight raises consciousness information moves you in a horizontal dimension you have better thinking, but you haven't really shifted consciousness. A horizontal change is temporary. Like people who go to meetings, let's say AA meetings or some sort of support meeting, 
the while they're at the meeting, they're all feel really good, and then they leave, and pretty soon their thoughts come back about using, and they relapse because they're they're looking to an external source to give them the feeling, and it, it's a good thing to have camaraderie and a group support. There's nothing wrong with that, but unless they have a shift in consciousness through insight, they're going to slip back. But even if we slip back, once we've had an insight, we remember that insight and we remember that feeling and, we, and it, op- it puts us back in a position where we can have a, a deeper insight. So the, it, it's a leapfrogging, kind of a hand over hand, climbing the rope, you know, um, kind of a process. And that's what's, you know, like people that leave the Gulf Breeze or other treatment centers I've worked with, they don't always have 100% sobriety. But their recovery from relapse is, that's what we should really measure, is their recovery from relapse is much quicker and it's more lasting. Rather than how many days of sobriety do you have? That's a really false uh, denominator for measuring success, I think. I think the true success is, uh, how's your insight going? How much insight has a person had? Because the insight will will um, even make a relapse, whether it's a relapse into drugs or just relapse into depression or discouragement or hopelessness or any other form of habit. Those those relapses actually are wake up calls. They they're a slap in the face. They're a, a shaking you up to wake you up to see something deeper. So I, I, I'd love to hear what other people are thinking with what I'm saying and any comments or questions or stories that you have that, that you can relate to what I'm saying here. Yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself or click on the raise hand the feature raise. in the participants tab. Hi. Hello. Hi, this is Judy from Oregon. Hi. Um, Hi. Hi, hi, Joe. Good to see you. Uh, wonderful, wonderful insights. Um, yeah, the the whole thing about uh, what you just said about relapse uh, is was really impacted me because we we actually have the the, the uh, we have the wrong understanding, just like you were saying about relapse, and that it's always a learning experience or can be a learning experience. And um, I just love the the idea of of seeing of of measuring you know the recovery time really from a relapse because it's so it's such a powerful indicator of what's already been seen. So anyway, thank you for that. I really 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 appreciate that. And I've met so many people in, who have had maybe twenty years of recovery or. They say, yeah, well, I've, got, I've been sober for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, but they haven't had a shift in consciousness. They're hanging on with their fingernails to their sobriety. They're not experiencing serenity. And that's when I heard Sid, why I wrote the serenity principles. I thought, wow, this is the missing link because in, in 12-step meetings that I had attended, whether they were Al-Anon or AA or NA, there were always a few people in the group had had a had had that wake up. There were some people that that they were the anchors in the twelve step meetings. They'd had a profound realization. It was that shift in consciousness, and the others were kind of living off the you know catching their wake, you know so to speak, riding there on their coattails because they hadn't had that experience. And what Sid showed us is that that experience was available to everyone. And with the simple understanding of mind, thought, and consciousness as the creator of experience, that the infinite power of mind that is connected to all intelligence, all knowing, all wisdom, we are not separate from that. We are one with that. We are divine creatures. And when we realize our oneness with that, we no longer feel alone or frightened or um, hopeless. We know that it's 
we might not be feeling it right now, but it's going to come back. It, it, it's available to us. And that to me is, is it's like when I ski, I, I love to ski. So I'm, and it's snowing out. So I'm thinking of snow skiing analogies. When I, I ski, I've been skiing since I was 14 for 56 years. And I'm a pretty good skier. And I ski off off the beaten path and into the off country. I fall all the time. I hurt myself. I'm tumbling. I And when I'm doing, I just love it. I'm laughing. You know, it's like, who cares if I fall? I don't have to look like I'm doing it right. I don't care. I'm just skiing. And it's the same thing, I think, with the principles. When we fall, we relapse. We go back into old thinking, so what? We know we know how to ski. <laughs> we know how the mind works. So it's, it, it, we're not so frightened by our own human experience. I think Sid said that a, a better way, you know, uh, it, if, you, if, if human beings could just not be afraid of their own human experience, that alone would transform humanity. Said another way, if people didn't believe everything they thought, it would transform humanity. <laughs> so true. So how, how do you define recovery? We talk about this a lot, you know, finding recovery from these addictive habits. That's the question? Yeah. How, the, how would you actually define recovery? What, what does that look like to you? I, you know, I, I, in a way, I don't like the word recovery. <laughs> It's for me. It's more uh, reawakening. I guess you could say recovery. It's recovery of our innate health. It's recovery of our innate divinity. It's recovery of our innate resilience. So traditionally, we think of recovery from a disease. And I always call this a health recovery model rather than a disease recovery model. And that's a paradigm shift in and of itself. Because if you're focused on treating disease and symptoms and behaviors and thought patterns, then you're, you're, you're already too late. You're, 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 you're working on, you're washing the walls with dirty water. Instead of going back to the, to the get in a fresh bucket of water with clean soap in it and then wash them. So you, 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 you direct people back to their innate health. And that's the beautiful thing at Gulf Breeze who I'm currently working with most often is that you, 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 when you walk in there, it, you can just feel the, the feeling. People are happy, they're uh, supportive, they're compassionate, they're loving, they're present. There's a feeling there that um, it exudes health, it just exudes healthy healthiness. It feels healthy there. As a, a, a professor of addictions at a couple of different universities, my job was to go and visit all these treatment centers, 12-step mostly, but other models as well. And um, some of them had that feeling to a degree, but not to the degree with the three principles treatment programs that I've worked with. Most of them were so depressing, and so toxic that when you walk in there, you go, Oh God, get me out of here. And the staffs were burned out and stressed out and, and there was no joy. It was just kind of drudgery showing up to work and, and people were, you know, avoiding the clients and talking about them behind their back. And, Oh, that one's oh, never going to make it. And that's, a, you know, so the, the, the vibe without, with a disease model, not always, but a lot of things can be really negative. Because I know as a clinical psychologist, I was spotting illness. That was my whole job was to look for symptoms and disease and, and diagnoses. 
And that was on my mind. And so guess what? That's what showed up in my therapy sessions. And guess what? I got totally burned out. Man, it was a drag. And when I got new glasses, not these, but Sid Banks glasses, and I, I came back from that initial weekend where I met Scotty and many other people, and I, I looked like my clients had all changed. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is, I really got a lucky batch of people. These guys are, there's no resistance. They're really responsive. You know, this is really, and I just thought it was them that had changed. And it was Roger that told me this or who said, but Joe, your clients are the same. You've changed. <laughs> you see them differently. And because of that, they see themselves differently. The, the model you're talking about, Joe, is really salt spring. That's what happened. Everybody it, it took the dregs of the society, basically. And, and the energy of truth came, came across it. We still had a lot of thoughts obviously in our evolution but the feeling was so powerful that it was the driving force of our life so i think recovery from the salt spring model is when you step into accepting that is that is the truth and this is still happening and within that happening we go up and down on a personal level in and out uh, and we ha still have a lot to deal with, my own immaturity, my own bad habits, uh, on and on it goes. But, but the feeling was so powerful of truth that it, 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 every morning we woke up with that in mind, or we quickly walked into that in mind. And we would meet people, like you're meeting in Gulf Breeze, where that energy, where the, the, ener the momentum of the love is more powerful than the momentum of the fear. And it, it, it's, it, has, it, it heals. Mm -hmm. And, it, and as, you, as you notice, it doesn't just heal in addiction. It heals in a comprehensive whole way that solves, answers questions to us just because our spirit is lifted in our mind. And so honestly, I felt like you were talking about Salt Spring and what, had, what evolved. And of course, because of what happened on Salt Spring, the psychologists came and then they took it out to the world. And that was the next evolution. And Sid's ch teaching changed from that as well. Mm -hmm. And God bless you guys for, for taking it out in a way that the world could, could understand because they weren't going to get it from the people from Salt Spring. Did with Chip and Elsie, but it had to be you guys who could understand uh, the language that human beings wanted to hear. And uh, that, yeah. that brings up a really good point, Harry. You know, I think that one of the things as as helpers, and a lot of you are are helpers here uh, in one form or another um that we really um you know like if you were a missionary let's say and you were preaching the gospel and you went to africa before you went there you'd spend six months learning the language and the culture um you know m missionaries have known this forever by the way i was going to be a missionary at one point in my life at age 18 it didn't last long but anyway so that's how i know about missionaries and <laughs> You never knew that, Harry, did you? Yeah, it's going to be a Catholic <laughs> priest. Father, uh, you. <laughs> no, it's, it's like this, Harry. Oh, 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 sorry. sorry. Yeah. No, oh, wait a minute. It was like this. We would do this at Mass, yeah. Yeah, okay. But um, you, you have to learn to speak to people. And in order to speak to them, you have to listen to them. You have to really respectfully listen to people and get to know them so that you can translate this very simple, profound message in a way that they can hear it as best you can. Nobody can do it perfectly, but 
my my work has always been about being a bridge to communities. You know, whether I worked in the addiction field or uh, I probably spent as much time working in the healthcare field with physicians and nurses and that whole field. Um, and I'm gonna do a, a retreat in a, a couple of months with firefighters. And I've never worked with firefighters. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. my son's a firefighter and I'm going to, you know, do a ride along with him and I'm going to do a ride along with a bunch of other firefighters in St. Paul because I'm going to, I want to get in their world and know their world before I, and respect their world before I try to teach them about the principles. So whenever I work with like at Mayo Clinic, when I work with them, I went on rounds with the doctors. I went around, I, I went and talked to the cooks in the, in the uh, cafeteria. I met with the custodians. I met with, I just walked around, hung out and watched and listened and got to know that world. So I didn't step on toes and so I was respectful. And so I was, I could meet them at a level that wasn't condescending, but respectful. So I think sometimes as practitioners, we, we miss that. Now, the, the feeling part that you talked about, Harry, is the most important, and, and it's the, the secret sauce that actually is the power. But, you know, like when I went there, I wore a suit and a tie at Mayo. Now, normally, I, I, I don't dress like that, but I wore a suit and tie, because they all wore suits and ties. <laughs> I didn't want my looks to get in the way of my message. So, there's a there's that's part of the art of applying the principles and teaching it as a practitioner is seeing how to build a bridge to your audience as best you can and um mostly by being truthful and honest genuine really listening and really caring for people. When you really care for people, they'll ignore a lot of your mistakes because they can feel that you care. Bill Pettit says that, you know, be, before, um, how does he say it? Um, before I can care for you, you have to know I care. Something like that. Any other comments or react? Yeah, Mark. Marnix, hi Marnix. Yeah. Good to see you again. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, Joe. Hi. Hi. Great to see you again. Um, uh, I, I, I want to say something about what you said earlier about the possible, the, the the capability of coming back after a relapse as being way more important than the number of days uh, of sobriety. I, I'm, I, I work with addicts in Holland. I've been addicted myself for 28 years, and it's, it's, it's a few years ago. <laughs> and I'm now with, with uh, uh, um, Michael's Super Coach Academy. And, and last, uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking to a client of mine, and, and, and he was very disappointed about himself. He'd been working for a few months. And every day, every, every time he, he quits drinking for a few days, and then he relapses. And then for two days, he drinks, and then he gets back to not, not drinking. And when I talked to him, he, he, was, he had been able to, to, to not drink for a week and a half. And, then, and, and he was so, and after that he drank again. He was so miserable about that. I was talking to him and he asked me, why is it possible that I am able to stay off the booze for a few days or I'm able to withstand all the thoughts about the drinking and then it gets back. And just as I wanted to say something about that, it hit me that, and I said to him, you know, your way of creating alcohol is, is, is your way. This is actually perfect. This is the way you are doing it. The only problem is, is that we have another <laughs> prediction about how it is supposed to happen. It just, it takes a few months with you, with your drinking, with who you are. So this is actually 100% fine the way you do it right now. Um, and it felt so logical and so true and so um, it, helpful in a way. 
so, so what, do you, what do you say to that? I you think that's, that? that's beautiful, Marnix. I think that's just beautiful. You know, I, I work with people that relapse all the time. I'm a continuing education or aftercare counselor at Gulf Breeze. And so I, most of my client caseload is people coming out of treatment. Yeah. And uh, relapse is common. And, and, and I always go, oh, that's great. Wake up call. This is time, you know, and you called me, you know, let's, you know, and so how I'm responding to it isn't like, oh, God, what's, what's the matter with you? Why did you do that? You know, God, you better get back to a meeting or what, you know, I, rather than judging him for it, I'm going like, this is great. You know, let's see what we can do with this. Let's yeah. see what we can learn here. And so how we, so that's demonstrating to them when they fall, how to relate to their, it's like us, you know, like when I, when I wake up in a bad mood, I don't go, oh God, I don't know anything about the three principles. I'm a total loser. What am I doing teaching this? I go, oh, I'm in a low mood. Big deal. Yeah. And if the low mood lasts for a lot longer, I go, wow, I must have something to do to see here. This is going to be interesting. I wonder what I'm going to learn this time. Yeah. So it's, it's really not how good or bad your thinking is or how high or low it is. It's what you make of it. Yeah. And as a counselor, Marnix, what you did was just beautiful. Yeah. You, you reinforced the changes he was making. Good Lord, there's probably more sobriety than the guy had had in 20 years. That, that's totally <laughs> true. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, it's got, got a lot to do with the place we're coming from. So if he says, I drank again, I say, well, yeah, so what? Let's try and, and, and have a few more days of not drinking. And let's see uh, what happens then. So, yeah. But, but the, um, the model is so much about punishment. And oh, we're so disappointed. And you should have, well, you should have stopped right now. So, uh, you know. Uh, well, I'm not working with you anymore if you can't stay sober. Yeah, yeah. It's actually a demand in, in a lot of systems in Holland that you, you sign for the fact that you won't drink for a month or something, or else you will not admit it. So it's very strict. Yeah, it's, cra it's, a, it's a, a archaic system of thought yeah, yeah. that's based on uh, shame and guilt and, and um, disapproval rather than love and understanding. Yeah. This is a love and understanding paradigm because it's love and understanding is a natural outgrowth of understanding thought. When you, when you see the innocence that you can only uh, see what your thoughts see, you can only feel what your thoughts feel, then you, and you can't change your thinking. You can't stop a thought from coming in your head. Has anybody been successful at that? I have. <laughs> Thoughts come in all the time that are just nuts, crazy, local. Mm. But something happens when you have an insight that allows you to have some perspective on your own thinking so that you're not a victim of your own thinking. And if you are a victim of your own thinking, you can't do it for too long because you know you're punching yourself in the nose. It's not somebody else doing it. Yeah. It's like Dr. Strangelove, you know? <laughs> if you haven't seen that movie, that wouldn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, I'm sorry. Could I, could I, add, could I add something, Joe, here? Sure. Harry, please add, add something, Harry. Uh, uh, Marnix, when the relapse is sort of the same as, when did I stop listening to Sid Banks? Like there was times when I was hearing and then there were long periods when I wasn't listening. And these long periods when I wasn't listening was always caused by lack of gratitude. I always, that lack of gratitude for what I had experienced was lost and then I, and then I was in my head. And so it's important for, pe for this person to understand that on the spiritual journey, when you lose your gratitude, which is the love and understanding that Joe is expressing, mm -hmm. you're going to have a relapse. Because you know, as well as I do, Marnix, the relapse happened a long time before the relapse. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> you know. Yeah. So, so that was for me the biggest profound insight, Arnix, to get to listening again to sit down, because I, for a long, long, long period. I, I want to emphasize a tremendously long period of time. What? Why did Michelle get his text? He is the person. A tremendous long period. I didn't listen, even though he was still speaking pure truth. And when I realized I had lost my gratitude, I said, I wonder where that feeling was when I was listening. Mm -hmm. And I went to that. And that re re that was recovery. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad this came up. This is kind of what I was getting at when I asked that question, Joe. What do you think recovery is? is to me, it has nothing to do with whether or not somebody is touching a certain substance or, or habitual pattern. You know, if they were into pornography and they go back to watching pornography for a short time, it doesn't mean anything. What really means something is, like you said, that, that sort of bouncing back from it, for lack of a better term, the, the, the ease and peace of mind with whatever comes along, whether that's going for the next 50 years without having a drink, or if it's the ability to have a drink every now and then and have it not be a problem. I believe it's different for each person, and, and there's this there's this tendency to lump certain people into categories and say, okay, you had a problem with alcohol, so you can never touch it again. Well, the problem wasn't alcohol. The solution was alcohol. The solution was heroin. The solution was sex and gambling and whatever else it is that we reach out for. It's not the problem. Mm -hmm. So this idea that abstinence from whatever was your problem is what the answer is really isn't the answer the answer is having that peace of mind that serenity that we've all been missing who have fallen into those bad well i don't even want to say bad habits but the uh the habits we'd rather not practice on a regular basis sort of thing they're not bad it's just because it the guy sitting next to me could have sat down and had three or four beers and been fine. And, and years ago for me, that was not an option. Three or four was just getting started. Whereas what I've found since coming across the principles is that I can go have a drink or two with people and just hang out and enjoy it and have a good time and not, uh, I'm not doing it to escape is kind of the big difference. It's no longer a solution. It is just, something like anybody else might do you know there's a beauty to that to returning to life mm -hmm. and not having those labels attached to it not having to say i'm an alcoholic therefore i can never have a drink again alcoholism doesn't exist it was a a, a made-up disease to explain something that people really couldn't explain at the time and it was a good thing at the time. When, when alcoholism was first deemed as a disease, it was a good thing because it brought compassion to people who were otherwise just looked at as, as moral screw-ups. You're just a horrible person. That's why you drink so much. That's why you reach out for cocaine and heroin and whatever else. But, you know, when it, when it was deemed to be a disease, it did bring some compassion, but it, the evolution shouldn't have stopped there. Yeah, and that's a big part of what we're talking about today is the evolution behind all of this. You know, so there's nothing wrong with where things have been. You know, it's it's that constant evolution that's going to help find help people find that true freedom. And that true freedom has nothing to do with whether or not you touch something again. It has to do with how you experience life in between those moments and during those moments at any point in time. And that's, to me, that's, that's the beauty of this that it's brought to me was that I can, that I can be okay even when I am in a, a bit of depression or whatever comes along. That's really the beauty of it. 
Well, and I, I would see, I would say that there are some people for whom um, abstinence is the best choice because it is for them. You know, that whether that's true for everybody is not, not really the case, but um, yeah, I, I related to, um, I was very uh, physically sick last year. I had a Lyme parasite called Lyme's disease. And um, I never, I was, I felt like I was dying actually and had no energy and my brain didn't work and, you know, I couldn't function. I couldn't write. I couldn't counsel. I couldn't do anything. I was pretty much debilitated. And um, so when I got diagnosed, it was a big relief to know what it was. First of all, that I didn't have cancer or Alzheimer's or one of these other things. And, uh, but the treatment, part of the treatment was that uh, they put me on, uh, they did all these food tests and had me see what, um, what I was um, allergic to or had a, a, a tendency to, to react to. And um, because the parasite, the Lyme parasite feeds off of inflammation in the body. So anything that you react to, it eats. And that's what keeps it, keeps you sick. So I cleaned up my diet. I, you know, I had to quit all alcohol, sugar, uh, gluten, dairy, I don't know, a bunch of, bunch of things, uh, eggs. And, um, and it was really hard at first because, oh man, I love my cookies <laughs> and my candy bars and, and all these things. And I went through this oh, thing. Yeah. And, and, and beer, oh God, I love beer, you know? And, and so, so I, but I, you know, I just kind of gritted my teeth through the first month or so and I started feeling a lot better, but I would test it. And um, one night I went out with my psychiatrist friend, uh, Henry Emmons and, We'd always have a couple of beers, so I had a, a couple of beers with him, and uh, I got so sick that night. I was just like right back at square one, and I realized this is really not an option for me at this point because I don't like feeling this way. I don't. It's it doesn't work for me. So it wasn't a have to. It was just a, a listening, a listening to my body, and for some people. Certain things work and certain things don't. I don't know why, and maybe that'll change. Um, but I think like in people that I've worked with in, in treatment that have experimented with using, for some people that hasn't turned into a big deal. For most, it has usually triggered an automatic, um, you know, it's like the, they say the, uh, the um, synapses are it's like the four lane highway <laughs> you know and it just off to the races and for some people it, it, you know maybe they can do it moderately but um i think everybody has to really listen within that there is no there is no ultimate rule or ultimate judge in this that you have to if you if you ignore your own wisdom you're going to get in trouble and if you, if you listen to it, your wisdom and insights will guide you to healthy living, what's right for you, what's the am right amount of work, what kind of food, you know, got, like since I, I had a, a profound realization that about my Lyme, I realized that I had identified with that disease as me, that I am a person with that disease. And I saw someone for healing, and he said, the first thing you have to do is never, ever say that you have that disease again as long as you live. Every time you say that, you, you send a signal to every cell in, through the quantum field of your body, and it recreates the illness. So you have to stop that <laughs> immediately. And when he said that, my intellect, well, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And he said, you don't hear me. It was like Sid. He says, you don't have a clue what I'm saying. I said, what do you, I've written many books about this. I know how the mind works. <laughs> this, is, this is not new for me. And he says, you have no clue what you're talking about. And I realized in this mind spot, you are absolutely right. I am totally clueless. 
And in that moment, it hit me like a ton of bricks. All the thinking I had been doing about this Lyme's disease and all the books I'd read and all the doctors I'd talked to, it, all, it was just every symptom, every little ache and pain or symptom I had was heard through the funnel of that belief. And it took me to a, a whole different level of understanding the power of thought in physical illness. It, and it transformed me. To this day, I haven't had a single symptom. I haven't had a cold. I haven't had any physical issues in over a year and a half now. It, it's just an amazing that, but I, my, for the 38 or 37 years before that, since I met Sid, I'd been in and out of all kinds of illnesses and back is issues and everything because I, I didn't understand the connection of thought to the body, my physical state. So this evolution never stops. There are so many cracks in our understanding. There's so many blind spots we all have that it, it keeps me damn humble now, I'll tell you at this point, because Man, I fool. I was so fooled by my own thinking. I can't believe it. So we have to just we just have to be open and listen and realize fundamentally it is a world of thought, including our bodies, including our relationship. Everything, it's all coming from thought. All of it in mind. Joe, is, is, sorry, is, is there something specific you do, you know, concerning your health right now? Is there something you, because it, it sounds pretty, pretty mind, mind. Well, it was, it was a, that insight, the next morning I awoke, I felt like a completely different person. My, I felt a, a, a more physical energy, more strength, mental clarity, all of that, uh, the disease left me. And, um, when I walked up to see a friend of mine who I had been with the previous week, she said, what the hell happened to you? And I said, and I, so I told her what had happened the day before, you know, this conversation. And it was just a 10 minute conversation. I'm walking through the streets of Chinatown, a busy town place. And, and she says, you look 10 years younger. And I said, I feel 10 years younger. <laughs> So it was, it was a, it was, it was a, it was another one of the major, you know, like I said, there's, there's transformations that are like on the dimmer switch, little ones, and then there's big ones. But one thing that without my understanding of the principles, I would not have been able to receive that information in the same way I did. All of the understanding I had gained before with the principles made me extremely responsive to that once my ego got out of the way, <laughs> thinking I already knew that. So you just dropped the, 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 the thinking about diseases in, in general? Or? It's just a fluke, Marnix, if you can't figure it. It's a okay, fluke. okay, <laughs> okay. It, 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 it's a surprise to Joe too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful surprise though. That's the beauty of spirit. Yeah. 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 And, and um, that's, you know, so, you know, I love second uh, book, Second Chance. It says where he, um, um, Richard was the guy that had cancer. And, um, and I know Sid never claimed that, you know, knowing the principles isn't going to cure you of cancer or whatever. But I've seen so many spontaneous remissions of all kinds of physical psychological addictive issues by simply hearing the truth of this that there there's it's so clear to me that the mind is the most powerful tool in healing it's not the only part of it you know there are all kinds of i still believe in medicine and going to the doctor and you know i just had my physical this week and my doctor i says i don't know what you do but i want to do it <laughs> you're doing you look younger every time i see you what's up with you and it and, and you know when you have that feeling when you're happy and you're alive and you love life it it it, it keeps you young now i'm gonna die <laughs> yeah I, no one's getting out alive here you know and i'll die of something i don't know what hit by a truck something but 
so I just, I'm not really afraid of it. I don't really care. <laughs> it's just part of life. You're, we're all going to die, right? Is anyone here not going to die? <laughs> working on it. <laughs> you work on that. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, good, luck. good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks. It's not really whether you die or not. It's how you die. It's the same thing. It's how you think about death, how you think about illness, how you think about your finances, how you think about your marriage, um, how you think about the weather. The experience doesn't come from any of those things. It comes from the thinking about those things. And that's the miracle of what Sid brought to the earth. It's so damn simple. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Just ridiculous. <laughs> Who else has a comment? How are we doing on time, Greg and Harry? Well, we, we, we have no end line to be honest, Joe, but it does feel like we're, we're, we have sort of reached the place where, where that is. Uh, I'd like to draw a comparison. When Joe came on last, he sounded totally different. And that's the beauty of what, what truth does. Joe is expressing what he feels right now. And it, it's, it's, it's just an ordinary expression of, of that feeling. And he's different. And that's that's transformation, and I mean different in a beautiful way, Joe, like in a in a heartfelt way. And this conversation today is is more like uh, people talking in their living room, sharing ideas about what addiction, which is not a negative topic, by the way. That alone is a, a label, addiction. Everybody. You, you look at it, they, they shy away from this title. The greatest problem I had with writing my book is the evolution of addiction recovery is I've never been addicted. And as soon as someone hears the title, they go, oh, what are you telling us? And I'm going, I'm not telling you anything. I'm just writing a book, you know, about addiction. So it, 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 today, there was a very beautiful feeling, Joe. I really want to thank you for that and for the... Um, the uh, simplicity of what you understand. You've grown so much. Joe, like me, I wanted to bring one point up. When Joe was talking about the principles, sometimes we go for a long period of a lull. In my case, enormously long period. Joe also experienced a period of lull and it made him better. It made me better. The appreciation when you come out of the lull is actually I wasn't wasting my time. <laughs> I was just doing what Harry or Joe had to do. So don't get worried if the lull lasts like a little more than a few minutes or a few hours or a few days. In my case, years. But those years were I was learning other things. I just didn't realize it. It's a spiritual journey. That's all I understand. That's great. It's thought. And I love that aspect of it. And the psychologists have really helped me to get a little bit cleaner understanding of that. But it's a spiritual journey. And this journey is the, the, the natives call it the great mystery. And I think that really applies to everything we're doing in life. So, Joe, I love what you shared today. It was very, very gorgeous. Very gorgeous. Um, can, can I share one more thing, Harry? Yeah. Um, Same price, right? <laughs> Danielle uh, Gana, who was on your show here a couple of weeks ago, um, she and I are going to do a six-part series for people who um, are in some way affected by... Um, an addict, someone who's in their life that their their parent, their child, their um, spouse, a good friend, but somehow it is impacted by someone with a substance abuse or alcohol, some sort of an addiction. And so we're it's for families in in recovery, and we're, we're calling it awakening resilience for families in recovery. And it's um, so anyway, if you're interested in it, if you go to the website. 
Joe Bailey and Associates. They'll be in, uh, or on my Facebook page. Uh, I have a little video on there uh, talking about it. And um, we're going to talk about all kinds of things that are in common with people who are, who love it, uh, someone with an addiction. You know, whether they get judgmental or they, they um, worry all the time or, you know, that we all have our, our ways of relating to that, that this paradigm, this understanding can really help. And that's been a part of the population in, in recovery that has really been missed. And I've always been, I was a pioneer in the family therapy field of addiction before I ever learned about the three principles and tried to bring working with the family into my work with addictions. Uh, I work with Virginia Satir and Sharon Wegscheider and some people way back in the 70s and we were brought the family in but I want to this webinar series is 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 really to address that audience so if you know anybody or that applies to you or your clients please pass on the word so that people can learn more about this and and I you know her but Debbie Machilla would be good to, to once in a while I'll, I'll ask her to come on that show for with you as well, because she has a tremendous amount to share on that topic. Yeah, Debbie, is, I've talked to Debbie, and actually she's doing, a, coincidentally, she and Christian McNeil are doing a program almost identical, and it, we, it was just, again, synchronicity that we both thought of it at the same time. <laughs> Two islands of monkeys, huh? huh? Yeah, there's a the, the hundred <laughs> <laughs> and it well, does is, build community uh excuse me it does build community and community is needed in this area and joe that uh, was beautiful to see you sharing with uh oh okay a second um catherine conrad said they aren't doing the program anymore christian and debbie did they not do it or that they're done with it catherine are you there? Or uh, Katie, I mean, Katie Conrad? No, it's Kathy, and, and they aren't doing it. Um, they're, they, uh, they have canceled it, so they're not doing it. I talked to Christian yesterday, or the oh. day before yesterday, so um, it's not something they're doing now. But uh, I love the idea, and I'm, I'm glad you're going to be. Yeah. So I want to just chime in and say that that's, uh, I'm going to, we're offering also a family program. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. You're <laughs> yeah. Put in a pitch. Yes. Yeah, really, really. Um, I, actually, I just wrote an ebook, uh, short, uh, for family members. It's called The Shift Transform Your Relationship with Your Addicted Loved One. And um, I'm also creating a, um, 28 day audio program for family members that they can do while their loved one is in treatment. Um, that um, basically, you know, teaches uh, this understanding. So, um, yeah. And I'm also, I'm also going to start doing a Facebook live called ask Judy live where people can come and just ask their questions. Um, oh. And I, that's going to be on Mondays at 11 AM Pacific time. So. Anybody, you know, anybody that could, uh, you know, use that kind of support, please send them my way. <laughs> Great. So um, how do, how do we, uh, how do we get those materials and things, you know, because I yeah. think it's great for the, for the clients at GBR at Gulf Breeze to have that available for their families. Yeah. And I'm going to be sending you the book, uh, Joe. Great. And also, uh, they can go to uh, my website, which is um, wisecaring.com, and uh, they can get the free ebook there. Oh, it's free. Wow. Yep. Good for you. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. It was wonderful, wonderful time here. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Yeah. Good to see all of you. Thanks, Joe. And good, and good yes, thank you, everybody, for participating. Thanks, Joe, for joining us. It's been awesome. And uh, looking forward to I seeing what everybody creates here. <laughs> what? I said, Scotty, say hi to Gene. Oh, I will. I will. Say hi to Michael.